Hey everybody, welcome to this week's podcast. I'm mostly caught up with some of the articles that I've been wanting to write, but there's still a few things that I haven't gotten a chance to yet. I don't think any of them are time sensitive, um, but just in case, maybe keep your eye on RetroRGB's main page this week and check for new posts. I'm pretty sure there's no like pre-orders opening uh, except the ones that I'm already going to talk about and all that stuff. So uh, I'm just trying to keep up with all of the backlog, which is overwhelming. It's still awesome though. I'm not complaining. It's just, it is what it is. So um, I'm pretty sure we have everything out this week in time for what it needs to be. Uh, Keep your eye on the front page of the website as always for up-to-date news and let's jump in to see what's happened in the past week. Last week, Samson 7.1 posted a review of the Satiator and how it differed from the beta to the production and how it arrived. And I really absolutely loved it, except I had a bunch of questions about the save game manager that was made by a different developer that now works with it. Um, Luckily, Samson was able to go through and do a video showing how it worked, as well as post their thoughts on it. Um, I highly recommend watching the video for anybody interested, because if you're going to be purchasing a satiator, you should definitely check out this feature. Um, The only point that I would definitely like to make that Samson brought up is that if you have a dead battery in your Saturn, you're still playing with fire doing it this way because when you reset the Saturn to go back into the, the main menu, you could end up losing your save games that way. So on the other hand, though, if you're regularly replacing your battery, I think this is probably worth... Uh, you know, a worthwhile substitute for doing something like an FRAM mod, if you don't mind the extra work. So basically, you know, you fire up the Saturn, you look, your battery's still there, your saves are still there, you play your game. Uh, When you're done playing, you reset, then copy those from the internal memory to the satiator's SD card. uh, And then that way you could power it off. And if you power it on the next time and your battery's dead, doesn't matter. You could just restore your saves and everything's all good. So uh, excellent point by Samson that if your battery is fully dead, you're not, that probably wouldn't work for you. But overall, I just think it's absolutely awesome that if you're already going to spend the money on a satiator, you could now have this uh, save game backup tool, which means you don't have to worry about any of the cartridges. And if your Saturn's anything like mine, the those cartridge slot any things don't really work right. I, to this day, still have to jam a folded up index card behind whatever cart I have in there or else it won't work at all. So um, thanks to Samson for the write-ups and I'm definitely looking forward to checking out the Satiator, at least the production version of it when it arrives. Chipnetics Computing is now selling complete kits and just the cases for GBS control. Um, You could purchase the complete kit for $80, which includes the Wi-Fi module, um, the software install on it, and the clock gen. So pretty much everything that you would absolutely need to have modded on it, as well as the case, as well as the power supply, Um, but with the inputs and outputs exactly as it was just a a case a plexi case so you don't have to worry about anything shorting out when you put it down and all of the mods already done you could have for 66 dollars the same exact thing just without the clock gen mod um which i you know i appreciate the need for that but at the same time i could imagine a lot of people not installing it and never really noticing a difference uh you would avoid screen tearing on occasion which i didn't really run into in my limited testing Um, but it's just another cool option. And then finally, it's $10 for just the case, which I think is really great too, because I also happen to think that if you're looking for a project that's just one step past like a Super Nintendo Mini RGB mod, this would be it. I really think this is a pretty cool project for people that want to learn how to solder, as well as people that just want to get to lo- get to know the Arduino. Arduino, Arduino, I still don't really know how you're supposed to say that, but uh, how you, to get to know that software, I think this is a cool project, so you could pick up this case. Um, I still really wish there was a fully enclosed 3D printed case as well. Uh, and of course, I'm still excited for the GBSC all-in-one case, the one that I showed in the video that has SCART inputs as well as a built-in HDMI converter. Um, But I mean, it's going to be different features for different people. If you're going component video uh, into this thing, or I guess even VGA in, then you don't really have to worry about any of that other stuff. So very cool that there's options. Uh, And if this is something that you are looking for, definitely check this one out. 
The 2020 version of the Neo BIOS Master is now in stock. Um, so for anybody unaware, this is a device that allows you to take Neo Geo MV1B and C motherboards and disable the onboard BIOS and use this board that just sits right on top of one of the other chips and you could insert the UniBIOS into it. Um, so while that might not sound so exciting, before this was invented, you would have to individually solder all of the wires. So we're talking... 40 wires, I think, uh, you'd have to do manually, which was a giant pain, and this makes it super easy. So if you're looking to purchase one completed with one of the Unibios 4.0 uh, pre-flashed and installed, it's $25 plus shipping. Um, so it's a, it's a pretty awesome thing to have. Um, I have one in the mini MVS that I built, and generally speaking, the kind of the way I've been looking at this, which some people disagree with me, but if you're using ROM carts, you probably don't need this. You might want to check into the Unibios features to see if there's really one or two things that you would really need on this. But if you use original cartridges, it's pretty much mandatory in my opinion, because it just unlocks everything that you could possibly imagine, all with software. Even basic things like holding down a couple of buttons to have a pause in game and you know have the in-game menu to be able to change these options. So it's something that if you're an MVS fan, you're at least going to want to learn about. And if you have a ROM cart, maybe you don't need it, but it's really something that people that use original carts should at least consider. Uh, so check it out while they're still in stock. And uh, I guess the only real difference between this one and the previous version is this one's been upgraded, so you no longer need to solder two more of the extra wires. You could just drop this right on. So overall, it's an awesome kit. Modern Vintage Gamer just posted an awesome video explaining how dithering works on the PlayStation 1. And dithering is something that I've always wanted to do my own video on. Uh, there's already a great video that Displaced Gamers did talking about the Genesis version of dithering. Um, this video focuses on exactly how it's done on the PlayStation. And I also showed it a little bit in my Rad 2X Saturn video, uh, in this, especially in the, the ball the glowing orb thing in the beginning of Nights into Dreams and how in composite video it looks like a transparent orb and then even with RGB on an RGB monitor not even on a flat panel you just see a bunch of circles that aren't blended together uh, and it's something that's always kind of fascinated me I definitely want to go in depth and do another video on it um, but I really like how MVG kind of focused directly on how the PlayStation 1 does the dithering and why you could see it so much and it's so common in PlayStation 1 games. So I highly recommend watching this one, especially if you plan on watching another video I'm going to talk about later on. John Linneman from Digital Foundry just posted a video on Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 1 and 2, both the original 1 and 2 and then the new one, 1 plus 2, or however you're supposed to say it. Um, and it was absolutely amazing. I mean, almost all of the Digital Foundry videos are as top-notch as it possibly gets, but it's still, for whatever reason, this one really resonated with me, and it kind of renewed my interest in the Tony Hawk series. And one of the things that stood out that I could even remember all these years later is when my little brother first got a Tony Hawk game. It was around the time of gaming where, like, there was always a some kind of training mode, and, you know, you couldn't just play a game. You would actually have to sit there and learn something and go through some dialogue. Whereas the Tony Hawk games, you fire it up, some awesome music starts, and then you just start playing and having fun. And you don't even really need to know how to play it. You could kind of just figure out, like, all right, one thing moves, and then you just press the buttons. And it was very natural to learn on my own. And the gameplay itself, you know, the physical controls of how everything felt was also a huge factor in that. Uh, and that's something that John touched upon in the uh, comparisons. And of course, John also went back like uh, his typical style and compared each of the original versions to the different console releases. And then of course, compared them to the latest release, which was the remake. Um, and he thought it might have been one of the best remakes of all time in video games. It's certainly up there in at least the top 10 and probably better than that. So uh, I highly recommend the video. There was no real spoilers there. There. It's a, an in-depth enough video anyway, where, uh, you know, even if I told the ending, like it's still something that you should probably watch if you were into the Tony Hawk games at all. So definitely props to John on this one. And if you're interested in the series, it's, I would add this, it's long. So like, wait till you have some extra time, but definitely add this to your must watch list. 
This next thing isn't directly related to gaming, but it certainly involves everybody around the world in the retro gaming community. Uh, and I feel kind of passionate about it, so I'm going to go the opposite and try not to talk too much about it at all. I'll try to just skip to the end instead of ramble. Um, but YouTube decided that they're going to stop community-hosted subtitles. So for anybody unaware, any creator on YouTube could up till now toggle an option that allows people to upload subtitles to your video which for me has absolutely blown my mind at how many amazing people have offered to translate some of the more important videos or some of the interviews that I've done in their own native language which I just you know I always make the comment of I love how we are making the world a smaller place by doing this and it sounds so cheesy but it is genuinely how I feel and YouTube decided that they're going to just stop that, and they gave the dumbest reasons. They said they're not the it's not used that much, and it could be used for spam. Well, anything can be used for spam, and not every great feature is used that often. Like it's like in my mind saying we're going to stop putting airbags in cars because most people go through their whole lives without being in a car accident. It's like just because you don't use it every day doesn't mean it's not important. But luckily, and to the point of this rambling and this post, um, some people in the community have stepped up and had a solution for this that doesn't involve YouTube at all. So you go to the link posted here, YouTube external closed caption netlify.app. I'm not even going to try to say that out. You can check out the post. Um, but basically, you just punch in a link to your video. So copy and paste whatever ever video you're watching. And uh, if there are community uploaded subtitles, then they're going to appear. Um, and you could choose from which one that you want with a disclaimer for each. And if there aren't any, you could upload your own. So now I realize that if people still want to submit subtitles, you could still mail them directly to the creator and have the creators post them on their own videos. But not everybody has the time to go through that. Not everybody's emails published. And it's just, it's, it's not as smooth of a feature. So having something like this is awesome. And I posted a link to an interview I did with Artemio that some amazing member of the retro gaming community translated in Spanish. And I made sure to re-upload their subtitles so that even if this feature goes away and all community hosted subtitles are deleted you could still go up and have this feature and just watch it through this browser rather than anything else now it kind of stinks because that also means you can't get that on the youtube tv apps and stuff like that but this is certainly better than nothing um you know the whole thing about uh trying to fight spam is ridiculous because some youtube channels are just the worst cesspool of awfulness and I can't imagine people that would try to only use these subtitles for spamming when, you know, going into the comments is so much easier a way for people to spread their awfulness. That being said, it would be very, very funny if somebody could upload a clip of Voltar and I talking and you just put subtitles of something completely different than what we're saying. Like, your shoes look nice. Your mustache is off place. <laughs> I don't know. Spam the heck out of it as long as it's fun and there's no hatred involved. Uh, go right ahead. But I personally would rather endure all the spam in the world than lose a feature that potentially means that some people can't enjoy some of the things I'm working on as much because it's not in their native language. So I tried to keep the rant short. I'm proud of myself. It is short for me because I'm kind of long winded. But, uh, you know, it stinks that YouTube really just fall short of it, of helping its creators every chance it gets. But luckily, other people are out there to help fix this for us, and this is a decent solution. So if you were one of the many people that were amazing enough to offer to translate other people's videos, your work did not go to waste. It still could be re-uploaded here. Um, and let's try to keep stuff like this alive, because I, I hate the fact that it's 2020, and I still have a problem of some people in the world can't understand what I'm saying because I don't speak their language. We should be techno technologically advanced enough so far to not have this happen. We're getting there, and something like subtitles really is a big help. The documentary Console Wars is finally being released. It'll be September 23rd on CBS All Access. And this is based off of the book by Blake Harris that I've talked about quite a bit. And so far, it's by far my favorite telling of Nintendo versus Sega in the late 80s and early 90s. And it's probably by far my favorite documentary or, or historical writing, if you will, about video game history. Um, I'm not sure why this resonated so much with me. Maybe it was because I was a kid at the time and it really struck because I would remembered a lot of this stuff unfold in the press. But uh, this is just something that was a book that I really loved and they'd been talking about making it into a documentary 
documentary for a while, and I'm really glad it's finally happening. Not so pumped about it being on CBS All Access. I had I, I had problems with it, and I've heard other people did. I ordered it right through the Apple TV app. It worked once and never again. Uh, and then when I tried to email them for support, they said, you don't have an account with us, but I kept getting charged for the account. So uh, I really wish it was on any other platform whatsoever, but I guess it is what it is. <laughs> so um, if you're looking for a really awesome documentary, I'm hoping if this is half as good as the book, it's still going to be better than the documentary that just aired on Netflix. Um, so hopefully they did it right. Based on the people they have working on it, I, I really think that they would. Uh, I'm still excited to watch it either way, though. So September 23rd, CBS All Access. Uh, and if you're somebody that prefers reading over watching, just buy the book. It's super cheap on Amazon still. I think I'm pretty sure I have it linked down below. I do. Um if you're watching right now, that's for the hardcover version. It's much cheaper if you just pick it up from uh, Kindle. I think it's $5 or something. But anyway, uh, awesome book. Highly recommend it. And let's hope the documentary doesn't stink. Retro computer fans now have a really cool option for a homebrew-made sound card. The Orpheus ISA card is designed by the community for retro gaming PCs, um, designed under the purpose of being as compatible with DOS and early Windows versions as possible, which if you grew up in that era, you probably remember the nightmare of trying to find drivers on a floppy disk. Uh, there was no just jump on the manufacturer's website and download it. Um, and I think driver support for certain cards is still equally as crazy as it is as it was back then. So this card is designed both to get over that by being pretty much Sound Blaster compatible uh, and having it based around a uh, chip controller, which is known for its compatibility. But it also integrates a bunch of cool features like optical audio, um, and it has a few MIDI options as well. So pre-orders uh, are open now. It'll eventually be sold at Surge Shop, but if you'd like to pre-order, your choices are the sound card for 130 euros, um, the sound card with the PC MIDI module installed for 180 and the sound card with PC MIDI and Dream Blaster 2 for 230. Um, and the Dream Blaster 2 is uh, a wavetable header MIDI module. So it's basically a MIDI, uh, a miniature version of what you'd find in a real Roland or Yamaha stack. But overall, I think that if you want this card, you probably already know what these things are. Um, and I always, every time I see somebody post something about this, I just really want to get into retro computing. I just don't have the space for it. It, uh, but I would love to rebuild the computer that I wanted as a kid. You know, I vaguely remember having a 486 with a math coprocessor with with four megabytes of RAM. I definitely remember cousin Scott and I like our little minds blown that we had that much RAM in our computers. I'd love to rebuild something like that, but at the highest spec possible. And I still haven't had time, but I really want to check out the 486 core on the Mr. But if you're into original hardware, this is something that you should definitely at least look into because it looks pretty awesome. Laserbear.net is now selling a 3D printed tray and SD card extension for the X-Station optical drive emulator. Greg was also nice enough to donate that file to the community, so if you have your own 3D printer, you could download and print the design yourself. Uh, keep in mind, you'll also have to purchase separately a SD card extender to have it work like this. And I have such strong feelings about this. Uh, you know, first, you absolutely do not need this. Um, the X station works fine on its own. You could reach your hand in and, and pretty easily get to the micro SD card. So if you're on a budget, don't worry about this now. Keep it in the back of your head and get it if you ever want to upgrade. However, I love this thing, and I, I love all of Greg's mounts like this um, for a couple of reasons. First, yes, you have the convenience of having the SD card broken out right there. Uh, it does change micro SD to full size SD, but pretty much every micro SD card comes with an adapter anyway, and it's the same exact speed, so that's not a big deal. Uh, that is handy, and that's certainly easier than reaching your hand in. But the more important things for me are you never have to worry about accidentally dropping your micro SD in, which is something I used to do 
all the time on my Dreamcast before I got Greg's mount for that. And it just completely eliminates the worry about that because uh, every time you do, there's, you know, just the way luck has it, you most likely can't shake it out. You'll have to unbolt the console and you don't really want to be shaking these things hard anyway. So having this tray in completely eliminates that, but it also looks really cool, which I know is useless, right? Like who's going to see when you open up the lid to your PlayStation console? Even if you have friends over, the lid's going to stay closed most of the time. It's just one of those things that looks so cool and I just appreciate it so much. You know, I'm not shitting on Greg when I call it useless. I'm just, I'm trying to keep everything into perspective. I'm not trying to tell people you need this with your X station, but it just, it's so cool. I think most people would probably want it. It comes in gray and black. Uh, the black stands out really nice. It's really striking when you open up the, the lid. It just looks very cool. I chose the gray because I just kind of wanted to see how it blended with the original color of the PlayStation. And it almost looks factory. I mean, it, it's, it's pretty awesome. So, you know, all the respect in the world to Greg for making these things. I mean, no disrespect when I call it useless. Just I want to make sure I tell everybody as it is. This is one of those things that you definitely do not need. Um, but I, I love it. And, I, you know, it, and also the price includes that SD extension. I knew when I tweeted about that the other day, a few people were kind of concerned that it seemed like a bit expensive for just a 3D printed tray, which is true because it's not just a 3D printed tray. You get the extension with it. So, uh, you know, if you've got an X station, at least consider it. If you're on a budget, wait till later. But um, I, I certainly love these things. Pre-orders have opened on the Neo Geo MVS X, and the first reviews are in. And i got to be honest, I've tried at least three times to record this section of the podcast, and I end up going off on a very long tangent every time. I must be chatty today or something. So I want to do this as quickly as I can while getting all the facts out without rambling. Um, so basic facts, it's 500 for the full kit, which is a, a scale arcade machine with a tabletop. It's 450 for just the tabletop version of it only. And then if you wanted to buy the stand separate, it's 100 for that. So if you were on the fence, maybe just buy the whole thing for 500 and save the 50 bucks. Um, Retro Ralph and Justin from Console Kits, also an awesome retro RGB contributor, have done the exclusive live stream reveal. And then Ralph the next day posted uh, the just a more polished and shorter review of it. To be honest, I would watch both of them if you were uh, if you were really into this and you were considering getting one. Uh, both are awesome videos. I learned everything I learned about it from the live stream, but the other video is awesome as well if you're looking for a shorter version of it. Uh, and overall, it seems to be about the same quality as the better Arcade 1UP units. So super short, if you don't know what those are, Arcade 1UP uh, makes three-quarter scale emulation-based LCD screen arcade machines, and some versions of them had multiple revisions, which they never labeled which revision is which, but for example, I believe it was Street Fighter, uh, they had a version of that cab that was released that was okay, they had a bunch of complaints, and then they eventually released a version of it that fixed a lot of those complaints and was probably worth buying. Um, and you can get those on sale. I posted the link here to the site that Justin created. Uh, Home Arcade Deals, I believe, is the site. I've found those as cheap as, I believe, under 200 which is a totally fair price for something like that. And if the Neo Geo MVS X at the same-ish performance was that price, I think every Neo Geo fan I knew would probably pick one up, including me. I don't even have the room for it. I would probably just leave it somewhere and eventually hope to, to try it out. But at $500, oof, that's going to be rough. Um, you know, overall, it looks nice. The buttons are decent. You know, pro gamers will probably want to swap those out with whatever their favorites are. Um, it has save states. There's no video output, which means you can't use it for streaming, which means right there, a Raspberry Pi has already got you beat. And uh, also, there's some video modes that are weird. So it comes shipped with the pixel perfect mode, which is a four by three aspect ratio and is, in my opinion, how it should be shipped. You could turn on scan lines, and then there's a couple of smooth scaling options, some of which are inexplicable, like smooth scaling with vertical scan lines. 
even though the con or the console doesn't rotate, um, and smooth scaling with scan lines at a 40 degree angle. And maybe I'm just really tired and out of it or something, but will somebody please explain to me why you would want 40 degree angle scan lines? I really hope it's one of those things that I read your comment and go, oh, that's why I should have I should have remembered that. I must have been tired, but it's baffling to me. I, I maybe I'm just not thinking of it, but. Overall, I, I don't know. I, I really liked Ralph's review. I really enjoyed the live stream. Uh, I do really hope that somebody takes the time to lag test this, though, because the bar is set pretty low. Most of these emulation machines are, are a laggy mess. And on top of that, you can get a Raspberry Pi, load up emulation, and have decent, respectable amounts of lag. So if you can't beat a Raspberry Pi... Uh, um, I did reach out to the company again. They responded once and then have been ghosting me ever since. And I got to say, if I were them, I'd ghost me too. Because the first thing I would do with a console like this is lag test it and publish the results. So if I made an overpriced emulation box, I would never want me to review it. Uh, and I, you know, I'm not like, I'm not bitter. I'm just being very matter of fact and to the point about this. So hopefully we'll see more reviews soon. And hopefully when they start hitting consumers and not just pre-release reviewers, there won't be any NDAs. So people will be able to tear this thing apart and tell you for real what's inside, how it works, how much lag there is and, and get other reviews on it. So my personal opinion, I would not pre-order this thing until people started to get it and, uh, and people's opinions uh, came out where they're able to just kind of tear it apart and see what's in it. So I managed to do this in under five minutes, which beat my other three tries by five minutes. So hopefully this was short enough to get you all the info and, uh, you know, not too rambly. I just posted my review of the PlayStation 1 Digital, and overall, I think it is the best option for hardcore PlayStation fans or streamers that want absolutely zero dropouts when switching between resolutions and games. Uh, you know, if you're a casual PlayStation user, a, a RAD 2X is probably the best way to go just because there's no installation, works on every version. But overall, if you're a, a PlayStation enthusiast, at the very least, you're going to want to check out the video and the other reviews. But it's something that you would really want to consider, and it performed really, really well. Um, now, there were other reviews out. I, I just was so swamped, I wasn't able to get my review done first. So I just figured I would go in the opposite direction uh, and do an in-depth look, as I was calling it. So if you really just want a basic overview and you want just, you know, what is it? What could it do? How does it look? I very honestly would suggest Metal Jesus' video on it. I think he did a great job. Um, he was fair in all of his comparisons. He mentioned those garbage cables, but he, he did so in the correct context. I still get triggered every time I see those horrible pieces of crap, but a uh, great video. So if you just want a basic overview or if you need to recommend one to a friend, uh, definitely you know, try Jason's video first. But if you want to know every option that's available now, at least at this firmware before Christoph and Dan had a million other amazing features, like I'm sure they're going to, uh, mine really looks at everything you would need to know. Uh, you know, I, I missed a few small things here and there. I kind of always do, but I had to just put it out because I was already deep into the hours on this one. Uh, one of my favorite parts of the video as well was showing what two milliseconds of lag looks like on a CRT. It was really neat. I, I really wish I had a better slow motion camera to be able to articulate this stuff better. But that's something that, you know, I was almost tempted to just take a clip of that and post it on social media. I, I might still. But um, it, so if you want everything you need to know about the PlayStation 1 Digital in its form today, you know, please check out the video. The only thing I think I forgot to mention is the audio is also digital to digital. Um, so, you know, it's as good as an optical mod or as good as using a PlayStation 1 game in a PlayStation 2 with the optical audio out. So overall, you know, highly recommend it to any enthusiast. It is absolutely awesome. Crystal clear video, which, you know, sometimes good, sometimes bad. You know, if you're playing Silent Hill, I'm not sure you want to see all those dots, but uh, just an awesome mod and Dan and Kristoff knocked it out of the park once again. And lastly, the Behar brothers have just opened pre-orders for their consolized MVS Ultra, which is a very cool Neo Geo MVS kit that includes a fully functional motherboard that has been fully restored along with a bunch of their different products that allow for both a SCART full just standard RGB signal output as well as a 480p VGA output. 
um, which is really cool. It comes in that metal case that I spoke about before, I think a few months ago when they first announced it, um, and has a bunch of really awesome features. Um, the pricing is 460 which is expensive, but if you consider what you're getting here, it's actually not. To be able to have a Neo Geo MVS that's consolized in an awesome shell, refurbished, even little things like adding a slotted battery um, and rather than just keep the one that's soldered on, also has 480p output. And then you, because it's 480p, you could just buy a very cheap VGA to HDMI converter. I always have them linked in the Amazon store. Uh, I showed in that lag testing retro scalers video that most of them, as long as they don't have scaling built in, there's zero lag. Or of course you could use it with the OSSC and stuff like that. But um, even if you just wanted 480p to a monitor, a $10 converter would work. And if you really put all of that into perspective, it's it's quite a lot of value. Um, I haven't been able to test one yet, but if I do, of course, I'm going to put it up against the other Neo Geo solutions out there. And I do want to, at some point, do a, a Neo Geo Super Gun shootout and take some of the inexpensive ones I've seen posted in the past few months, uh, as well as a few that are still in development, and really dig in deep and see if one stands up over the other or if they're all just really great ways to get RGB video out of a Neo Geo. And to be honest, with a lot of the open source work that's been going on, I expect them all to be pretty awesome. So um, overall, if you're looking for a Neo Geo MVS and you don't want to mess around with building your own or you don't want to worry about whatever crazy garbage I've seen on eBay, 460 is fair um, and this should turn out to be a decent product. I say should only because I haven't tested it myself yet, and I have trust issues. What could I say? <laughs> unless I see it myself or unless somebody I know that's reviewed stuff before says it's awesome, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to tell you to buy it unless I have. It just seems like a pretty good option. So, um, you know, thanks to the Behar brothers for continuing to make cool stuff. Um, and of course, thanks to Ronnie for writing this up. Uh, and also, I'm realizing that it also has a Unibios built in, which I spoke about before. So that's very cool, too, if you have original carts and uh, you have all of the stuff that you would need already built in. Well, that's it for this week. As always, thanks so much to everybody that watches, listens on any of the audio-only podcast versions, everybody who plays nice in the comments, and especially everybody that supports on any of the support services. Because without your help, none of these videos, the podcast, any of the behind-the-scenes research, or any of the other stuff I'm into would ever happen. So thank you all so much, and I'll see you next week.